This is Nightline, your open door to people and places, and this is Walter O'Keefe. Nightline invites you to listen in on NBC's award-winning science fiction series, X-1. Now escape to a world of the future. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, At the Post by H.L. Gold. But first, hear this. In centuries past, this was the sound that used to get the news around. Yes, in centuries past, the people on one side of the hill beat the drum to share the news of the world with the people on the other side of the hill. And since the world in those days was a smaller, more easygoing world, this was enough to get the news around. Ours is a chaotic age with critical events flashing across the face of the earth. Fortunately for us, we can keep up with these events because we have at our fingertips the fastest means of communication ever devised. We have radio. And NBC Radio, with news on the hour, keeps you alerted to world events wherever they happen, as soon as they happen. From ages primitive to present, people have wanted to keep up with events. And in our day and age, this is the sound that really gets the news around. This is Leon Pearson inviting you to keep up with the news on the hour all day, every day, over most of these NBC stations. Now, X minus one and our story, At the Post. When I come into the Blue Ribbon on 49th Street, west of Broadway, I could tell right away nobody told Doc Hawkins about my misfortune. Doc, who ain't one really, writes a daily medical column for the racing form, and we're celebrating his being sprung from the alcoholic ward. He got one look at me, and he choked on a piece of gefilte fish. What happened? What happened? Look at that. Clockers become a character. Now, lay off, Doc. A gray flannel suit, a black tie. Clocker. Where is your purple and green checked sports jacket? Where are your two-tone suede shoes? You become a character. It was Zelda's idea. She wanted to make a gentleman out of me. Wanted to? Why, you two kids got married just before they took my uh, snakes away. Don't tell me you already. You don't know, Doc? No. What happened? Well, it was right after you tried to take the warts off the fire hydrant that Zelda started hearing voices. It got real bad. How bad? She's at Glendale Center upstate. I just came back from visiting her. Did uh, the psychiatrist give you a diagnosis? Yeah, I got it memorized. Catatonia dementia preca. Oh, that's rough. Very rough. The outlook is never good in such cases. Well, maybe they can't help her, but I will. Now, Clocker, you're a race handicapper. You run the best tip sheet on Broadway, but people are not horses. Those couch artists don't know what's wrong with Zelda. I do. You do? Sure I do. Look. Look at these shots. Look. Here. Here. I use the same system I used to dope the races. Look. Zelda's got catatonia. She used to be a hoofer before we got married, and now she does time steps all day. Stereotype movements are typical of catatonia. You don't get it. She does time steps. The first thing you learn in hoofing, over and over, 10 or 15 hours a day. 
And she keeps talking like she's giving lessons to some jerk kid who can't get it straight. These catatonics work harder and longer at what they're doing than they ever did when they were regular citizens. And they don't get a red cent for it. I beg your pardon? I say they're getting stiff. Anybody who works that hard ought to get paid. I don't understand what you're getting at. What are they knocking themselves out for if it's for free? You know what it is all these people got in common? Not their age, not their job, not their, you should pardon the expression, sex. They're teaching. Teaching, Clocker? Who? I don't know. I'm working on that now. Doc, I tell you, I missed that mouse. I got to save it. Clocker, it's too much for you. Yeah, who was it said Warlock had turned into a dog in his third year? Who was it had seven winners the opening day at Belmont? You take my word for it, Doc. I'll beat the schizophrenia handicap. She can't see or hear us, but she can sure see or hear something, and I'm going to dope it. I had an idea now. I had it doped that Zelda was showing somebody how to dance, whoever they are. And the only way I could spring her was to find out who was controlling her and what they were after. The first step was to get them interested in me and what I know about racing, doping horses. So next time I went to see her, I sat beside her and I started to talk. Now, the first thing you got to figure is bloodlines. You take a horse, you got to know back maybe four or five generations on both sides. Then you got to know where the coat was full, what time of year, because all horses are one year old on the first of January. And there's confirmation, training. You take a horse with good bloodlines, break them in in the spring on a hard surface training track, and the first thing you know, you got a horse with a shin splint. And they may cover it up, but if you know it's there. Mr. Lark, I once knew a horse ran in Hialeah hey, and was scared of flamingos. Hey, what are you doing? Had a fine record at Gulfstream and Bowie, but when he got down to Hialeah and got one look at the flamingos, he wouldn't run for beans. Mr. Lark, are you all right? Shut up, I'm busy. <laughs> You're listening to At the Post, tonight's attraction on X-1. The new War Orphans Education Program. What is it? And what does it do? Well, here's the answer straight from the Veterans Administration. It's a training program for young men and women, sons and daughters of war veterans who died from service-connected causes. By war veterans, we mean veterans of World War I, World War II, or the Korean conflict. To qualify for this training, young men or young women must be generally between the ages of 18 and 23. The program offers up to 36 months of schooling, which is the equivalent of four college years training, with the VA paying an allowance of $110 for each month in school. The place to apply for war orphan schooling is your nearest VA office. If you are eligible and you're planning to go to school this fall, the time to apply is now. It takes time to arrange for your school. It takes time for VA vocational counseling. So don't wait for the last minute. Remember, your nearest VA office is the place to apply. Now back to X-1 and at the post. I kept coming back every day. I'd just sit there next to Zelda while she did a time step and I'd talk about horses over and over. And finally... Finally, I started to hear voices. Clocker. Clocker. This way, Clocker. Come this way. This way, Clocker. Like it was a fog, I could see the attendant in his white coat asking me questions, and I couldn't hear him. I knew I just kept on talking about the horses. And then suddenly I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. I was in a big square, and the buildings looked like the new Roosevelt Raceway, all modern. Or maybe like the World's Fair. There were trees and statues, and there were hundreds of people standing around, and they all looked scared. There was a little man with bifocals and a vest with pins and needles in it standing next to me. He looked scared, but I knew it had worked. I was on my way to Zelda. How did I get here? Ex- excuse me, mister, how did I get here? I don't know. Am I dead? I don't think so. Suddenly, the crowd all grew quiet when a man climbed on a big platform in front. He was very tall and dignified. And he had formal clothes and a white beard like the chief mourner at a politician's funeral. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please feel at ease. You are not in any danger. No harm will come to you. If you will listen carefully to this orientation lecture, you will know where you are and why. What is it? I don't understand. Friends, it's a pitch. You have been chosen... Yes, carefully screened and selected to help us in undoubtedly the greatest cause of all history, 
a vast and noble experiment. Smells like a con. Let me state this in its simplest terms. You know that there are billions of stars in the universe and that the stars have planets. In almost all instances, the dominant form of life on these planets is quite different from yours. I am not of your planet or solar system. I am not actually formed as you see me. My true appearance would seem to be rather confusing to human eyes. Nuts, get to the point. The truth is, we are not here, and neither Mm -hmm. are you. Here is a projection of thought, a hypothetical point in space, a place that exists only by mental force. What is he saying? What does he mean? Our civilization is considerably older than yours. For many of your centuries, we tried to establish communication with you, but there were grave difficulties. I'm sorry to report that those people with whom we did make contact were generally burned at the stake. Here it comes. He's getting ready to slip us the sting. You know the history of your own race. It is a record of incessant war, each more devastating than the last. Now, finally, man has changed the power of worldwide destruction. The next war, or the one after that, will unquestionably be the end not only of civilization, but of humanity, perhaps even of your entire planet. Then why have we brought you here? Because man, in spite of his suicidal blunders, is a magnificent race. He must not vanish without leaving a complete record of his achievements. This is the task on which we must work together. Every area of human society must be covered. We need you urgently. Your data will become part of an imperishable social document that shall exist untold eons after mankind has vanished. Oh, he had a slick con. He had that crowd in the palm of his hand like a small-time grifter selling pearl necklaces on 6th Avenue. They all cheered. After a while, he broke us up into divisions, and I got herded into a building marked Sports and Rackets. I started telling them about horse racing, but they held me down to one sentence. They said I had to repeat it over and over so that recording thing could get it. Apparently, it only absorbed things slow. Well, that's enough for today. Isn't it amazing? We have a more detailed record of human society than man himself ever had. Your life, my life, the life of this Zelda, whom you came here to rescue. All are unimportant, for we must die eventually. But the project will last eternally. You're telling me you know what I'm here for? To secure the return of your wife. I would naturally be aware that you had submitted yourself to our control voluntarily. It was in your file that was sent to me by admissions. Then why did you let me in? Because, my dear friend, we know... Leave out the friend pitch. I'm here on business. As you wish. We let you in, as you express it, because you have knowledge that we should include in our archives. We hoped you'd recognize the merit and scope of our undertaking. Most people do, once they're told. Zelda, too? Oh, yes, Zelda is extremely cooperative, quite convinced. Would you like to see her? Yeah, sure I would. Well, that can be arranged. I'll call the arts and entertainment section and arrange a meeting. Zelda, Zelda, baby. Clocker. Let's get out of here. Oh, hello, Clocker. Aren't you glad to see me? I spent months and shot every dime I got just to find you. Oh, sure, hon, I'm glad to see you. But I can't waste any time. This work is so important. Isn't it wonderful? What's so wonderful about it? Ah, if they could let the earth go boom, it wouldn't mean a thing to them. Everybody wiped out, just like there were never any people. Not even as much record of us as the dinosaurs. Wouldn't that make you feel simply awful? I wouldn't feel a thing. All I'm worried about is us, baby. Who cares about the rest of the world doing a disappearing act? I do, and so do they. They aren't selfish like some people I could mention. Selfish? You're darn right I am. Zelda, listen. I'm selfish because I got a wife and I'm nuts about her and I want her back. Listen, I have to help out on this project, hon. It's the least I can do for history. History? What did history ever do for us? Go turn in your time card, baby. Tell them you got a date with me back on Earth. No, this is my job just as much as theirs. More even. They don't keep anybody here against their will. I'm staying because I want to, Clocker. Zelda, you're being kind. Excuse me, Clocker, i got to get back. I'm teaching him the soft shoe now. (laughs) 
Are you satisfied now, Mr. Locke? Listen, what's in this for you? We're devoting our skill to recording a race that is about to destroy itself. That's enough game. There, that's the hook. Take away the doom push and this racket falls. Listen, what makes you so sure we're going to commit suicide? Is there any doubt of it? Do you honestly believe the Holocaust can be averted? I think it can be stopped, yeah. Listen, between these catatonics and me, we could tell them what it's all about. I notice you got people from all over the world here. They're getting along fine because they have a job to do and don't have time to hate each other. Well, it could be like that back on Earth. Mr. Locke, we have already experimented in the manner you suggest. A human psychological mechanism defeated us. Yeah? What was that? Protective amnesia. They completely and absolutely forgot everything they'd learned here. Well, what are the odds on me remembering? Well, you're our first volunteer. Look, I'll give you a deal. You let me out and maybe I'll be the first case that didn't get amnesia. And I can tell the world about all this. I'll come back if I lay him out. You can pick me up any time you want. But if I make headway, you got to let Zelda go, too. Well, that's a reasonable proposition. We lift our control, Mr. Locke, for a suitable time. If you can arouse a measurable opposition to racial suicide, measurable, mind you, we agree to release your wife and revise our policy completely. <laughs> I came to at Glendale. Took me about two weeks to convince them I was all right again. And finally, they let me loose. I had to convince the world that they were throwing the race and that they needed the saliva test. So I started to write it all out in my tip sheet, in and around the horses. Around that time, I ran into Doc. Clocker, my boy. You've no idea how anxious we were about you, but you're looking fit, I'm glad to say. Thanks. Wish I could say the same about you and the rest of the world. Well, there's no need to worry about us. We'll muddle along somehow. You'd think so, huh? Well, I'm glad to see you running your tip sheet again. As long as the bobtails run, who cares what happens to anything else? Of course, nobody listened to me. I had posters printed telling everybody. I made speeches in Columbus Circle. I told everybody Doomsday was near. Nobody paid any attention. I sneaked into the balcony of the General Assembly, tried to shout a speech, and they threw me out. Very politely. I wrote the whole thing up for a magazine, and they printed it and sent me a check. Told me if I had any more fiction, they'd be glad to run it. I kept trying to tell everybody the truth about the catatonics. We ought to go to the hospitals and get ourselves let in and have the aliens take over and show us where we're going. Nobody'd listen. And finally, I went back out to Glendale. Oh, Mr. Locke. We were wondering when you'd come to visit your wife. Been away? I want my old room back. Oh, but you're perfectly normal. Give me half an hour alone and you'll be glad to give me my room. Ah, Mr. Locke. Back again, I see. I'm no dummy. I know when I'm licked. So do we, Mr. Locke. Naturally, you have no way of detecting the effect you've had. We do. The result is that because of your experiment, we're gladly revising our policy. Huh? Is this a rib? Nobody listened to me. Oh, but they did. Visits to catatonics have increased considerably. When the visitors are alone with our human associates, they tentatively follow the directions you gave them in your article. Not all do, to be sure. Only those who feel as strongly about being with their loved ones as you do about your wife. We've accepted four voluntary applicants. You mean I made it? That's right. Before long, we will be able to release the first group to go back and carry the message. Whenever you care to, Mr. Lang, you and your wife are free to leave. Okay. Okay, but I'll tell you what. I owe you plenty. I'll help make that record before I go. I'll teach you how to dope the horses. Is that what you want? Why, yes. All right, then let's go. The quicker we get started, the quicker we can get back. Fred Collins again. And I'll be back with a word about X-1 in a moment. Time, night time. The lights dim down for the curtain in theaters on Broadway. A Hollywood star greets the first guests at her party in Beverly Hills. 
in Chicago, the police plan to close the ring on a band of desperate criminals. At a world-famous circus in Paris, France, the star trapeze artist climbs to a precarious perch high over the center ring. In a Las Vegas nightclub, a hush falls over the tables as one of the great singing stars of our time steps out onto the stage. And in New York's Radio City, the studio warning light flashes, Stand by. Nightline is about to go on the air, taking you to wherever in the country, wherever in the world, exciting things are happening at night to make you more than a spectator, to make you a participant in these events. This is Walter O'Keefe inviting you to join us on Nightline. You're aligned to exciting entertainment at night every Monday through Thursday night over most of these NBC stations. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Dark Star by William Tenn. For everyone else, it was the anniversary of the first moon flight. For one man, it was just a tragically comic valentine. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you At the Post, written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Frank Maxwell as Clocker, Maxine Stewart as his wife Zelda, and she really is his wife too, House Jameson as the otherworldly Calhoun, John Griggs as the hospital attendant, and Sam Raskin as the confused little tailor. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Hear Nightline with Walter O'Keefe next on most of these NBC stations.